All right, so moving along, um, we have mm, not that one. We have science and education. Yes, indeed. Right. That's the that qu- topic very, very close to my own heart. Oh, uh, to me as well. Much as I'm not involved in education per se anymore, it seems to you be. You do TOSP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. I rabbit it on at dinner parties. <laughs> but it's very, very important. So this question was, not only does New Zealand have problems persuading young people to study science at university, it has difficulty persuading graduate researchers to eventually settle in this country. How will your party make science and technology more attractive to students looking ahead to tertiary education, and what can be done to encourage them to work in New Zealand? Going af- alphabetically again, ACT's core value was um, in, in primary and secondary education was decentralisation. So they essentially say that the, for the vast majority of students, they get forced into one type of school with one type of teaching, one type of curriculum, and one assessment system. And they say that this fails uh, a lot of students a lot of the time. They believe that um, more science friendly, science friendly schools, teachers and curricula will evolve in a more decentralised system. And so they cite a couple of examples from overseas. They cite a province in Alberta in Canada um, where there are a bunch of different format schools um, that take a different scientific approach to learning. And then essentially they cite that New Zealand faces a problem with providing interesting and well-paying jobs evidenced by the kind of brain drain and they note that New Zealand does extremely poorly when compared to the rest of the OECD in terms of number of people, educated people that stay and work in New Zealand and then they cite the link to the rest of their website for more information. Absolutely. Um, small note there, We sorry, we, we are aware that Alberta is a province but people get confused easily. Oh. It's also so big. Yeah. Like Canadian provinces are the size of entire countries and other places. It's truly bizarre. Um, right. Uh, the next one, Green Party. Um, so the Green Party says that they support facilitating a culture shift in attitudes towards science research and technology through school curriculum changes and initiatives like Green Innovation Awards in the Sciences. So their idea is to basically try and incentivize, well, one of their ideas is to try and incentivize students to stay in New Zealand uh, as opposed to leaving. Um, They make notes, and a couple of the parties do, of uh, there being a big hole in funding early career researchers, which is uh, postdocs, for example, postdoctoral researchers. Um, And that creates an incentive for for these young, very well-trained, very smart people to go overseas because they need to find work. Um, They also say additionally that we need to support secondary school teachers to inspire the next generation of scientists among us uh, so that we need to set in place things that um, help enthusiastic teachers do their work. Um, They need to have, they say, time and energy to be creative and pupil-focused activity rather than burdened with administrative demands. And um, go on to say, to address this, we support initiatives like after six years of service, teachers, including early childhood education teachers, will be entitled to a sabbatical leave for one year at 80% of their salary. Ooh, so a very strong, strong focus there on uh, the teachers as well. So next one up is Labour, and they come straight out of the box by saying the years immediately following graduation are critical to consolidate the careers of scientists, and then they cite the removal of the postdoctoral scholarships in 2010 um, as a significant barrier to that career pathway in New Zealand. Labour's intending to reinstate those postdoctoral scholarships and uh, increase the amount of funding that's allocated towards them, and they're also looking at a better scheme for funding brilliant scientists, and that it will th- that is intended to allow scientists to take the most appropriate position at a research institution or wherever they, or wherever they like to purchase the appropriate equipment and get the rough, and specifically to attract world leaders to New Zealand. And then they finish up by saying that more information will be released when their science uh, policy is released next week. Comes out, yeah. And then National finishes off uh, with saying uh, or or opining that the attraction of science and technology for young people is directly linked to how it fits in with how they see their futures. As they say, the more important high technology industries are to our economy, the more people will want to work in the sector. Greater opportunities will lead to greater interest. So they talk about developing vocational pathways for young people, so they can, uh, which will clarify rather an existing array of options, which means that students and families can kind of see the connection between what the students are learning at school and where, what industries it could lead them to. Um, and talk about manufacturing and technology being one of those pathways. Uh, these pathways will include things like a career and study map as well. 
well and also assessment standards valued by the industry in which they're going to end up or industries in which they're going to end up. Um, they also talked about increasing fundamental and talked about how they have already increased fundamental science funding through the Marsden Fund and uh, Health Research Councils. Uh, they also talk about the Rutherford Discovery Fellowships which uh, they created um, which which also give more opportunities for young scientists who are sort of a couple of years into their career to, to do work. And they make mention of the Advanced Technology Institute, which they say will create jobs for around three to 400 scientists and engineers, and more on that a little bit later. So yeah, this was actually quite nice. There's some decent thought going into a lot of these, and this is just personal, pure opinion, because it's straight where, I, it directly affects where I am yeah. at the moment. Um, good science teachers are crucial they are absolutely crucial almost you can talk to any scientist and at least one of them will have had an amazing science teacher at some point i ended up doing molecular biology because of my biology biology teacher it was that simple i ended up doing a phd and everything else that i do because of one lecturer that i had at university dr howard lukefer um so good science teachers make all the difference they really do the other thing that is really obvious to me is the uh, the importance of keeping talent in new zealand um my qualm that none of these responses quite pick up is that People don't necessarily want to go and study science overseas. A lot of them don't go and study overseas because that's where you know need to go to do good science, because that's not true. You can do world-class science here in New Zealand. Mm. The thing is, it's a New Zealander thing about being young and going overseas and doing your um, your big OE, and a lot of scientists use their postgraduate studies to go and do this. Mm. Now, they're not leaving because they don't like New Zealand, but I think where we fall down is that there's little policy and there's little incentive to grab our New Zealand graduates and to, to bring, bring them, them back, back. in. Yeah. And there's, there's interesting murmurings. Increasing funding for postdoctoral scholarships will encourage and incentivize mm. these students to come back, but um, you are competing with uh, existing funding overseas. Yeah. So unless it's in advance or unless there's some particular career benefit, it's hard to see how that will act on researchers mm -hmm. to, to draw them in when you're competing with other countries with multi-billion yeah. dollar budgets to throw that way. Well, or, or attracting great people into the country. And again, mm. this, this is purely anecdotal. And, and But what I've, what I've heard from people, at, particularly in universities all over the country, uh, to a lesser extent, CRIs, is that there are many smart young postdocs who would love to come here to work, whether they are Kiwi or, oh. or you know, filthy foreigners such as myself. <laughs> but there is no money available for them because postdocs can be relatively expensive compared to doctoral students, for example. And often a hardcore decision has to be made that we're going to go with the cheapest student who's mm. basically almost as good, <laughs> but 70 or 30% cheaper and so there, there doesn't seem necessarily always to be a landing spot of any sort and once people have established careers overseas where they've gone through postdoc maybe they've you know they're teaching all of that kind of stuff then there's very little incentive for them to pick a, everything up to come back here to a system that is one of the most contestably funded in the world mm. and I mean as someone that consistently consistently buys cheap consumer electronics, <laughs> you very quickly realize that at the end of the day, sometimes you just have to fork out for a decent quality product if you want a decent result. Yeah, um, and true. Both to, to, for those of you that aren't familiar with the, the funding scheme, so PhD students get paid uh, two-thirds to half of what a postdoctoral fellowship will get paid, who get paid a significant fraction less than an actual full-time researcher. Yeah. So postdocs are cheap at the price that yeah. you get them for compared to other researchers as well but it's an expensive business it really is there yeah. are no easy easy answers i don't think there aren't but i'm glad that it's being seen that you know postdocs are an intrinsic part of this whole process certainly certainly in academia and so you know, it would be good if we could keep some of them in the country. I'm sure Elf is, is really hoping for that once he finishes his PhD. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually hoping the postdocs that I know will stick around because they are so focused, they're so motivated, and they're so great to know. Um, go Misa! Uh, that's, <laughs> it's a real loss. Um, it would be a real loss if they have to go overseas. To have leave. Absolutely. That's right, Frank and Natalie. I'm talking to you. All right. So now, now that we've gotten over the I love you, man <laughs> moment, although totally valid. Very cool. <laughs> uh, we'll move on to the next section. Um, now, this is energy. And again, a subject very dear to both of our hearts. So we picked subjects that are dear to our hearts and also that we felt that we could comment on without mouthing off inappropriately or potentially getting into trouble. 
<laughs> but energy is fantastic. Um, so the question here is, New Zealand is expected to become increasingly reliant on hydro, electric and wind generation in the move to alternative energy sources. How would your party provide a boost to the science needed to help diversify to other green energy sources, such as sustainable wave and tidal power and additional geothermal plants? And what policies would you implement to, hus- to help households rather cut their energy consumption to reduce the need for new generation? So, ACT uh, comes off saying, I'm actually just going to read their statement. Um, <laughs> because it explains itself far better than I could. The ACT Party does not support direct government investment or picking winners in the energy sector. The corn ethanol debacle of the past decade is a good example of why governments shouldn't try to do such things, as is the mothballed Marsden B power station at Ruakaka, I think big project that was built and never used. To the extent that government should try to change the energy sector, it should do so using broad-based taxes such as a carbon tax and let the market function, although ACT does not currently support such attacks. Hmm. Right, moving on to the Greens. Uh, the Greens say that part of their green jobs priority is to leverage the state-owned energy companies to generate investment in renewable energy technology. Uh, they make mention of initiatives like a startup capital fund specifically targeted at clean tech opportunities, boosting government funding of R&D by $1 billion over the next three years through tax credits and grants. I can see Elf's eyes stretching. Additionally, strong in environmental regulations uh, for more certainty around investment in renewable energy solutions. And then they also talk about the importance of energy efficiency and conservation measures to reduce peak demand. So this is things like insulation, um, clean heat sources, and implementing a New Zealand energy efficiency and conservation strategy with what, what they refer to as real and achievable targets and milestones to assess progress. They are, for example, very interested in in things like cars being efficient. 